movies, but worse. Hello and welcome, my name's Glasgow101 and this is Uniquely New Zealand, the show where I talk about anything and everything New Zealand. For 2019, I want to discuss more unique and different topics on the show. So, in the spirit of that, books. Today I'm going to be talking about three different books, all from one author, Morris G. Most authors become famous for one book, one series, maybe one genre. However, Morris G's catalogue of stories is incredibly diverse. Say if you want to read a sci-fi book, well, Under the Mountain. You want to read a mystery? The Fire Raider. And if you want to read a thriller, The Fat Man. And that's just the three books we're talking about today. So without further ado, let's start with his most famous story, Under the Mountain. That's the wrong fucking book. <laughs> Damn it! Under the Mountain. Under the Mountain is a sci-fi adventure story. Over the years, it's been turned into a miniseries and a movie, and it's easily known as Morris G's most famous work and one of the most famous pieces of Kiwi fiction on the whole. The story revolves around a pair of twins, Theo and Rachel Madison, on vacation in Auckland when they encounter some strange going-ons. They're staying with their auntie, and they notice that their neighbours aren't quite what they've seen. The neighbours, the Wilberforces, are actually an extraterrestrial group of invaders hell-bent on destroying the Earth. With the help of a friendly old man, who also turns out to be an alien, Rachel and Theo must save the world and each other from this alien threat. I think the things that really stand out in Under the Mountain more than anything else is the concepts. While we've seen alien threats and heroic twins before, Under the Mountain manages to take these ideas and do them in its own way. I'd say one of the best examples of Under the Mountain taking a tired old trope and making it fresh again is its use of telepathy. In Under the Mountain, the process of telepathy, as Rachel and Theo acquire it, is called pebbling, and I'll read a passage from the book to explain how it does it. Make your mind clear. Push everything out of it. Not a single thought left. Your mind is a pool of water. Very clear, absolutely still. Now Rachel is going to drop some pebbles in. Theo sat with a faint smile on his face. He saw nothing, heard nothing. He waited for the pebbles to drop. Now Rachel, your mind must be cleaned out too. Get all that rubbish out. Decide what you want to tell your brother. Have you decided? Good. Now turn each word into a pebble. What colour do you want them? White? Now hold them, my dear. Hold them in your hand. I'm going to leave you to it now, and when you're ready, when you have them, just drop them into the pool, one by one. That is a very memorable way of doing that very simple concept, and Under the Mountain has a lot of ideas that it does in this flavorful way. That's how you do good world building, not necessarily inventing a thousand new ideas and taking a long time to explaining them but fleshing out the concepts you do want to work with and making them memorable. The world building in general in Under the Mountain is very strong, and a lot of the setup and table setting is very well executed. My issue with the book, however, comes at the climax. Without spoiling anything of the ending, I will say it did leave me... Yeah. It's kind of a rushed ending, and somewhat of an anticlimax. It really would have benefited from more. Our villains, for instance, spend a lot of the book being these kind of unbeatable, terrifying forces, but then we don't really get to see our heroes beat them in any kind of cathartic way. <laughs> when you have terrifying, horrifying, undestroyable villains, the best way of handling them is a really good punch-out at the end. Something to show how far our heroes have really come. And we don't really get that in Under the Mountain. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of good setup here, but it doesn't lead to anywhere good in the third act, which really does make it feel unsatisfying in the end. I still definitely feel as though this book is worth a read, but it's just a shame that the ending couldn't keep up the momentum it had in the beginning. Next book, The Fire Razor. 
Yeah, the fire raises all right. It's not really anything too special and falls into a lot of traps that Under the Mountain already did. Basically, in a small New Zealand town, a pyromaniac is going around setting a bunch of fires. So our group of ragtag teenagers has to scooby dooby doo it up and find who's starting the fire. Well, one thing I know is, we didn't start the fire. Fire Razor. So our main four teenagers are all kind of bland. As I said, it's basically Scooby-Doo. They've all got their own issues and personality, but none of them are really interesting. There's only one character I really cared about whose backstory was kind of interesting because I thought it was this big mystery. Essentially what happens is he's living on his own even though he's just a young teenage boy and he hasn't told anyone that his father has left him. About halfway through the book he fesses up to a teacher at school saying that his father is living in the next town over for work and sending him money. See, I thought that was a lie. You know, it's revealed about halfway through the book. It doesn't make too much sense that the father would leave without telling anyone. I assumed that the father was just dead. But no, apparently that was it. So that's disappointing. A lot of the plot lines in Fire Razor also kind of get abandoned like this, but... I didn't care about most of them, so that doesn't really affect me. However, while our heroes aren't that interesting, there are two very compelling characters, and those would be our villains. As I said, The Fire Razor's kind of a mystery book, so spoiling it is kind of a dick move. However, I will say, the very concept of a pyromaniac being the main villain is so interesting to me. See, a lot of the time, books go too far into motives, the who's, the what, the where's, and why's. With pyromaniacs, it's very simple. They don't even care about people. They don't want to hurt anyone, but they don't care if people get hurt. All they want is to start some fucking fires. And that's pretty great as a villain motivation. Being compelled in your head to do the thing. It goes at a fast pace and is well written enough that even when the bad plot lines start piling up, you don't really notice it. However, it's just a shame that this book wasn't done better, because there was a lot of potential there. The review of this one is kind of coming across more negative than I intended. It's a fine book, it just didn't do much for me. But, so that we don't end on a bad note, let's get into our final book. And, spoiler alert, it's the best one of the bunch. And now, let me introduce to you, The Fat Man. The Fat Man is a great book. Hell, it's probably my favorite since I read it again for this. And, honestly, a lot of it has to do with our villain. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The Fat Man begins with Colin Potter, a young boy living in New Zealand in the 1930s? I guess, they're kind of vague about the time period. Look, it's after World War I and before World War II. Anyway, Colin's town, and by extension his family, has fallen on some hard times, so Colin is missing the finer things in life. For instance, chocolate. So when he gets the chance to steal a block of chocolate from a stranger swimming in the creek, he takes it. And that was a big mistake. Immediately, we are introduced to the antagonist of our book, Herbert Muskie, or, as Colin knows him, the Fat Man. This is the thing about villains, and more specifically, villain motivations. There's two real angles you can take. One, you can either explain in great detail why they do what they do, what they're getting out of this, and what their master plan is. Or two, you can keep everything impossibly vague. Have your villain be this chaotic force of nature. There's obvious strengths and advantages to both sides of the coin. However, the fat man, more than any villain I've seen before him, walks the line between these two perfectly. 
On one side, you think you know exactly why he's doing this. On the other side, you don't even know if he's doing any of this on purpose. He might have this great elaborate master plan, or he might just be winging it. You don't know. And that's really the great thing about the Fat Man. Immediately, the Fat Man takes control of Colin, forcing him and blackmailing him into being his accomplice and helping him rob an old lady. The old lady, as the narrator informs us, is Mrs. Musty, aka the Fat Man's mother. However, Colin doesn't know any of this. That's another great thing about the Fat Man. How the information is doled out is kind of odd. The Fat Man is told in third person, with the narrator often giving us glimpses into the future or telling us where things are going to go way before it's actually relevant to the story. The information is doled out in really fun ways. For instance, it tells us a major part of the ending in the first page, but you get so wrapped up and captivated in the story that by the time you get there, you're completely forgotten. How and when information is given to us, the audience, versus the characters in the story is really unique and interesting, and lends more credence into the Fat Man being this terrifying villain that we know everything about, while also knowing nothing about him. After scarring Colin for life real quick, the Fat Man just kind of leaves, and Colin tries to move on with his life. That is, until Colin and his parents go to dinner at Colin's grandma's house, and who should be sitting at the dinner table but the Fat Man. The Fat Man, or as Colin's parents know him, Herbert Muskie, says he's come back in town to revisit his aging old mother. Ah, he robbed her. From there, the Fat Man rejoins this story, and slowly works his way into every facet of Colin's life, and his family's life. We get hints and clues throughout of why he's doing this, and fairly early on it gives us a good picture of what's going on here. But still, you don't know whether to trust the story, because the Fat Man's manipulations are so subtle and so clever, he might not have this grand master plan at all. He might just be living his life. That's another compelling thing about the Fat Man. A lot of his actions could be justified as just, this is who he is as a person, not necessarily a villain. And when you can start justifying your villain's actions as being human, that's when you know you get a villain that kinda hits close to home. By the time we get to the ending, the Fat Man establishes himself as one of the greatest villains I've ever seen in a story. He's one of those villains who could write a whole essay about why he does what he does, what he's meant to represent, and you could just have arguments upon arguments of what he was really getting out of any of this. I'm going on a bit, but I can say The Fat Man isn't a perfect book. There's some flaws, I feel like it definitely should have been longer, and there's some subplots and ideas in here that weren't perfect. However, when you're reading the book, all of those flaws just melt away, because it's just such a captivating story. This game of cat and mouse that you don't even know if it's being played while it's playing out in front of your eyes is just so fantastic. Under the Mountain, I read about in four days. The Fire Razor took a little longer, maybe a week. The Fat Man, I finished it in under an afternoon. <laughs> Morris G is a very good author. His writing throughout all of the books is very consistent and well done. However, for me, The Fat Man is the book of choice, and the one that I would recommend to everybody watching this. Well, I'm off to go read The Fat Man again, and I suggest you all check it out too, because it's one book that is truly uniquely New Zealand. Whoa.